you will see that initially enlargement was not really the choice for every European. It was because of the wars in former Yugoslavia and especially because of the, the developments in Kosovo that made European leaders realize that the, the real policy in dealing with instability in the region was enlargement. Welcome to the Eliamet podcast series. I have the pleasure to host in this podcast Ms. Radmila Sekerinska, former Defense Minister of North Macedonia, to talk about the European Union, about the enlargement policy, and how she sees the future of the Western Balkans in this volatile time. Thank you very much, Ms. Sekerinska, for, the, for this opportunity to talk to you and um, to make us understand what is happening really, not only in North Macedonia, but also in general in the Western uh, Balkans. And I want to start our discussion by asking you, are you optimistic about the integration process of the Western Balkans? Oh, well, thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, I'll have to say that I juggle between optimism and pessimism on a daily basis. On one side, uh, I was active uh, as a deputy prime minister in charge of EU integration when the Thessaloniki summit took over. And if someone would have told me 20 years ago that we would be still discussing more or less similar issues 20 years afterwards, without really accession at sight, I would have said no way or what I would have given up. So there is plenty of room for pessimism. On the other side, I have a theory that uh, if you live uh, in the Balkans, and especially if you do politics, uh, in order to survive, you have to be an optimist. So as I say, there are segments of the day where my optimism prevails, and there are times when some of the facts on the ground, some of the developments on the ground do make me worried and do create this sense of urgency and pessimism. Is there, a, after all, a realistic roadmap for convergence between the Western Balkans and the EU? And is the EU um, uh, sure that they want to welcome Western Balkans? You know, sometimes as a journalist, I see what they do and the talks and again the talks and and i feel that maybe there is uh, uh, they're not very sure about how they want to deal with western balkans there was an old saying uh in the balkans uh that uh we pretend to be reforming while the eu pretends that they want us in uh, and this game of pretense is visible from time to time. Uh, on the other side, neither the region nor the EU are one entity. You know, you have people within the EU who are very enthusiastic about enlargement, who are aware, especially now after the, the Russian aggression in Ukraine, this is simply a geopolitical necessity. There are people who have really worked hard on making the Balkans closer, move closer to Europe. But there are also others. And I'll have to say that we haven't seen a unified raw enlargement mood within the EU, uh, maybe in the last 10 years. Uh, the appetite was gone. Uh, there were plenty of developments within the region that gave you enough arguments to stall to delay decisions. But on the other side, when I go back and analyze even the previous enlargement, the big one uh, towards Central and Eastern Europe, you will see that initially enlargement was not really the choice for every European. It was because of the wars in former Yugoslavia and especially because of the, the developments in Kosovo that made European leaders realize that the, the real policy in dealing with instability in the region was enlargement. And this was the time when many people said that enlargement is the best EU security and foreign policy. Uh, I want to believe that the uh, war in Ukraine has made many more reserved Europeans open to the idea of yet another enlargement. 
the developments uh, between Belgrade and Pristina recently, the situation in Bosnia, they also show that we should not take security for granted. And that the best way to deal with this region is to push it towards reform and embrace it for uh, convergence and for uh, a spread of democratic European uh, values. So uh, I, I, I share your views that sometimes it is difficult to decipher what does the EU really want. Uh, but uh, lately, I think that some of the arguments uh, in favor of continuous uh, enlargement have been slightly stronger. And this is the opportunity that we in the region should not miss. Are you worried about the systematic effort of other powers to influence developments in the region at the expense of the EU? And uh, at the end of the day, are they succeeding? There is a, a lot of talk uh, and a lot of reasoning behind that talk about the malign influences uh, in the region. Um, of course, when the, the, the war in Ukraine erupted, in a way, uh, you don't deal with this less visible war when you have a real full-scale war very close to the region. But uh, although uh, the, 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 the size of this engagement is sometimes marginalized, we see these narratives throughout the region. And, uh, you know, in the past, European enlargement, uh, the promise of a European membership was seen as the main antidote to the efforts of Kremlin to especially uh, Russian influence, which was visible, to spread across the region. Unfortunately, after the, the delays in some of the EU decision-making in the last two, and, two or three years, instead of supporting the region to deal better with the malign influences, in a way, the lack of EU decisions opened the space especially for Russian disinformation. And let me tell you how. Uh, for example, uh, there is always an opportunity to say, listen, the EU is not really quick and determined on enlargement, but neither are the countries from the region. Look at them. They're not really eager to deliver reforms. They're stuck in some old nationalism, old uh, uh, not so democratic narratives, et cetera, et cetera. So these were the excellent excuses for anti-enlargement individuals within the EU. But then if you analyze the experience of North Macedonia, you will see that this has uh, practically uh, uh, neutralized these narratives because uh, after 10 years of a very strong message from the EU saying that we will start accession talks with North with that time uh, Macedonia uh, after they solve the problem uh, of the name. And we have gone through a very difficult, painful, unpopular process of negotiating with Greece and reaching the PRESPA agreement, which was a big breakthrough from, for the region and I think also for North Macedonia and Greece. But it was seen also as Europe's success. And in parallel to the PRESPA agreement, North Macedonia has done extensive media reforms. We were one of the front runners in terms of progress on media freedoms in the world in, the, in that period. We have done significant efforts to improve transparency of governance, the rule of law. As someone said a few days ago, North Macedonia was the perfect student. And in the moment when all this materialized, we had domestic reforms and we solved, solved a problem that was troubling the region for three decades. And what did the EU do? The EU postponed the decision. This created an incredible maneuvering space for the Russian propaganda and disinformation. They didn't have to come up with fake news. They, they basically used this situation and said, look, 
the EU cannot be trusted. In the period while we were negotiating and implementing the PRESPA agreement, uh, the main uh, Russian uh, uh, narrative was portrayed with lots of nationalism, I think both in Greece and in North Macedonia. But basically they were saying, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up your national positions. And then at the end, they were able to sell to the other countries in the Western Balkans, look at them. In North Macedonia, they have done everything by the book. They have done the domestic reforms, they have solved the problem, and they were left with nothing. And this kind of indecision, this kind of delays by the European Union uh, actually created the narrative that Russia afterwards used. And you can hear these uh, comments both uh, in Serbia, in Kosovo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina as an excuse not to do the right thing, either not to do the reforms at all or not to engage in solving some of the difficult political issues that we know the Balkans is full of. Do you believe that uh, NATO could help or that NATO also changed the dynamics because Albania, Montenegro and North Macedonia joined NATO? Uh, it was clear uh, that they had the capacity and they had the willingness to deliver. When the PRESPA agreement was signed and uh, we had uh, the expectation that it would mean NATO membership and start of the accession talks with the EU, what our citizens saw was NATO delivered. The invitation was issued in the course of weeks and in, in a very short period, all member states ratified the accession treaty and we were a member almost in no time. So basically it was our NATO entry that gave us some space uh, to continue working, to continue reforming. If it was not for the for the NATO invitation uh, several years ago, I think the PRESPA agreement would have been a, a stillborn. It would have never uh, developed as a successful implemented document. Uh, so it did give the EU some breathing space. It gave us in North Macedonia, some, as a government, some breathing space. In the meantime, it is clear that NATO has given uh, the, the three members, uh, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and Albania, uh, more of a, a support, both in dealing with some of the disinformation campaign, but also in projecting this uh, stability, image of security, especially after the, the war in Ukraine. And I think it has an overall stabilizing uh, effect in the region. Look at the developments in Kosovo, uh, when everything else was not working, when the countries, Kosovo and Serbia, were uh, so distant on all issues, there was one thing that they all agreed, including us in the neighborhood, K4 importance, NATO's uh, capacity to actually soothe the tensions, to bring more confidence to the process, and to convince everyone that peace is still an option. So I, I, I do believe uh, NATO has played an incredibly um, uh, positive role. I do believe that EU can play even a more prom prominent role. But what we need is the region who is determined to change and an EU determined to lead. And uh, without one or the other, we cannot expect progress. Ms. Kelinska, I thank you very much for this discussion. You helped us see what is happening in the region um, and towards the EU, but also uh, in your country and in general in the Balkans. I thank you so very much. Thank you very much. And let me thank uh, Elia Mep for being one of the strong European uh, voices, both uh, in supporting the region and in supporting strong uh, and, and active European Union. Thank you.
This was another Elia Map podcast with Odin Linardatu. Recording, editing and sound editing by Petros Karpathiou. Follow us on the Elia Map channels on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and elsewhere.